All right, guys, so here's the first part of, uh, there's going to be three lectures, videos here about the Doppler shift, okay? And um, so I always like to talk, start talking about Doppler shift with a picture that looks like this. And you can see, um, you know, it, it doesn't take anybody, uh, you don't have to be any kind of military expert to realize that this is uh, a gun firing a bullet, okay? And uh, some of you probably could identify what kind of gun this is, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what I want you to focus on in this is, um, let's start with the bullet over here, okay? So the bullet is coming out, and you can see there's something like, like the wake on a boat, behind that bullet, okay? Now, that happens to be what we would call the shock front, all right? Shock front, okay? And the shock front is, um, it's, it's like the sound, except the sound has all kind of gotten compressed, okay? So this is a vibration caused by the bullet moving through the air, and, um, the front edge of the bullet creates part of the shock front and a different shock front is created by the end of the bullet, okay? So what happens here is the bullet is pushing, it's shoving air out of the way, that creates a high pressure front and then that, that air sort of snaps back behind it and that creates another shock front behind it, okay? Now, this giant circle here all right, this is the shock from, mm, that color didn't show up too good, sorry about that. This out here, this giant circle, that is the shock from the actual gases expanding out of the uh, end of the muzzle, all right? And so if you could kind of see this thing in 3D, it'd be like a bubble centered on the end of the projectile, okay? And all those ripples that looks like are in the middle, those are actually on the outsides of the bubble going around. The bubble's not perfectly smooth, okay? It's a little crinkly, so to speak. And so we can see those ripples on the different sides uh, of the bubble there. But what's important to note here is that bubble expands at the speed of sound, which I'm gonna use C, okay, for that. So that's gonna be approximately 340 meters per second, okay? And you can see the bubble is out, it got out there ahead of the shock front, okay? So the bullet is way over there where you see it, and in the time that the shock front from the escaping gases is only right there. So we know that the bullet is moving faster than the speed of sound. So this is a supersonic bullet right here, okay? Now, this is what you get anytime an object uh, begins to go faster than the speed of sound, okay? You can get a shock front like this, okay? And so, like, if you're familiar with a whip, you know, you've got a long whip and you go, whoosh, okay? That sound, that's the shock front that you hear created by the tip, or it's, it's not exactly the tip, it's right near the tip where the speed of sound um, is either exceeded by the whip itself or you create enough of a pressure front to create a shock. Now, that's actually pretty complicated and we're not gonna go into it, okay, because that'd be a whole nother lecture all by itself, okay? But what you need to realize, the way you need to think about this in your head is that when objects are moving, they have to push the air out of the way, okay? Now, if the object's moving slowly, all right, it pushes the air and the air can move out of the way, but the air can only move out of the way at the speed of sound. So for most objects, psh, that's not a problem. It's not even remotely an issue. But for a bullet, for a, a, a jet or something like that, a rocket, then um, it's going too fast and the air can't get out of the way, which creates a sort of a snowplow effect. And that's the shock front, okay? Now, you've heard about, you know, objects breaking the sound barrier and they make a loud boom. Okay, a sonic boom when you break the sound barrier. Okay, 
Number one, there's no barrier there, okay? It's not like a piece of rubber and you got to poke through it, okay? It's not a barrier like that. That's a metaphor. That term comes from the the technological barrier of not being able to go fast enough. There's no physical thing that happens. And you don't have to be going the speed of sound in order to create a shock front, okay? That's a myth, all right? Now, most of the time, they are, but you don't have to, okay? That's a, that's a myth. Um, and that shock front, it's like the wake behind a boat because the same thing is happening in your boat, right? So if you're, if you're out on the lake and you're traveling along on the boat, all right, um, you're probably going to be going faster than the waves themselves. Okay, so you end up pushing the water in a way that it can't get out of the way very easily and it, and it makes the wake, okay? Now, the angle of the wake that it makes, so like, let's say here's your boat here, all right, and you've got some wake coming out like this. Brrr, all right, uh, based on the angle here, all right, let's call that theta right in there, you can determine how fast the boat is going, okay? Spy satellites do that all the time with uh, naval ships, all right, in order to know how fast they're going, okay? So if the Russians sent a... Um, uh, a group of boats, some destroyers, maybe aircraft carrier. If they sent that out into the Atlantic or into the Pacific, our spy satellites could look at the wake and based on that angle, they could say, okay, these guys are headed at, you know, 30 knots towards Hawaii or whatever. Okay, so you can learn all that. Same thing with the bullet here. The angle of that shock front, which in three dimensions is actually a cone, you could tell the velocity of that bullet. All right. So let's talk about how you make a picture like this. OK, this is an example of something called Schlerian photography or Schlerian imaging. All right. And you have to use um, some special lighting and some lenses and you want to have light that's set up to make parallel rays across here. And then what happens is the speed at which the light moves through air actually depends on the density of the air, okay? And so this is this is a lot like if you're at a backyard barbecue. <laughs> Remember those? <laughs> backyard barbecue, okay? And you've got coals burning, all right, or whatever. Or you've got a hot surface where you're cooking burgers or hot dogs or chicken or whatever. Um, and there's like heat rising like this. And you look... And everybody on the other side of that, it's a little bit wavy, kind of like that. Same sort of deal, okay? So the density of the air affects how the light transmits through it. So you get some kind of shadows sometime. And Schlerian photography is a way of seeing those shadows, seeing the way that um, the light gets bent through the air. And that tells you something about what's happening with the air, okay? And so back over here, we get this nice shadow here, okay, because of the way the light is bending through that, okay? It bends away from it, all right? It's very much like if you go to a pool and you look on the bottom of the pool, you see like weird shapes moving around, kind of like that. Those, those shapes depend on what's happening at the surface. OK, so it kind of like turns the surface into a lens and that can affect where the light is going to go. OK, so if you want to see some cool stuff, I recommend that you go Google Schlieren photography or Schlieren imaging like this. You'll see all kinds of really neat stuff. OK. OK, now I want to talk a little bit about. Doppler shift, um, just to kind of build on what you learned in your um, soft chalk, okay? So there's, you know, with the Doppler shift, the pitch is going to go up or it's going to go down depending on what's happening, okay? So here's a nice simulation, and there's a link to this um, in eLearn, and, and I recommend that you go play with it for just a few minutes. You need to build some intuition about how these things are behaving, okay? And so here's the source, and here's the observer, 
And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with the observer. Okay, let's give the observer some um, pretty small velocity here. Okay, sort of like this. And I'm going to let the thing run. Oh, I don't want my source moving though. Hang on. Just kidding. Zero. There we go. All right, so my observer is moving away. Boom, 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 boom. There, you can see that going in there. Okay, now, so what's happening is the observer is moving away. It takes a certain amount of time for the wavelength to get from one place to another, but it's got to chase you. So it's it takes it longer. The wave fronts take longer to reach you, okay? And so that creates um, a, a downward shift because instead of the wave fronts hitting you every half a second, it's maybe every 0.6 seconds, okay? So the period is stretched out, all right? And that uh, changes the frequency. The frequency is going to drop, okay? And um, so this, you know, tells us about here, the perceived wavelength, okay, and the perceived frequency, all right? So if our source frequency is 343, then we're coming out over this here. I wonder, can I change this number? Uh, doesn't look like it. Okay. Anyway, um, so you can see that. All right. Now, the faster my observer goes, the stronger the effect is. Okay. So now the sounds really have to chase, having to chase down my observer. And that has the effect of stretching out the wavelength quite a bit and therefore reducing the frequency quite a bit. Okay. So here you can see the wavelengths. They're going to try and chase this guy down. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, sort of like that. Now, if we go the other way with our person, our observer. Okay. Now, what's going to happen is the observer is going to hit those waves more often than they would normally. So if the period's normally half a second, boom, 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 you're going to hit it like boom, 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 boom. Okay, so the frequency is going to appear to go up. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here we go. Boom, 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 boom. There we go. So it's as if the wavelength, well, it's not as if. The wavelength is shorter, the effective wavelength, and the frequency is going to go up. Okay, so with the moving observer, what happens is the, the frequency is different. How quickly those wave fronts hit you, it's either slower if you're moving, if there's if the gap is between you and the source is increasing, those things are slowing down. If the gap between you and the sound source is shortening, then they speed up. Okay, so let me reset this, and I'm going to put our observer velocity to zero. Hopefully, there we go. And let's give our source some speed here. Okay, now what's going to happen here is as the source sends out sound. It's not in the same place every time the sound goes out, okay? And so the re the effect of that on the source side is that the wavelengths out in front get shortened and the wavelengths behind it get lengthened, okay? So let's take a look here. All right, so you can kind of see what's going on there. Boop. All right, and so we got a shorter wavelength out here in front, but a longer wavelength behind us, okay? A shorter wavelength corresponds to a higher frequency. Okay, here's our shorter wavelength. Here's our increased frequency, just like that. Now, if we move the opposite direction, what's our velocity here? And I do the same thing. Now you're going to see we're behind it and that wavelength is stretched out. Okay, so it's a longer wavelength, which results in a shorter a smaller frequency, okay? So it drops down. We're shifting up or down. Okay, let's take a look at one more situation because we could have our frequency, our source moving, and we could have our observer moving into it, okay? So my, my gap is really going to get short quickly, all right? So the source is going to see a, a compressed wavelength, or, or the source is going to create a compressed wavelength, and the observer is not only going to have the compressed wavelength, but they're going to hit those wave fronts faster. So it's like a double effect. It's kind of like a double Doppler shift here. Okay. So boom, 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 boom. 
Okay. And so the perceived wavelength goes way down and the frequency goes way up. Okay. So anyway, try different combinations there. Okay. Um, try, try a combination where the source is moving maybe at 50 to the right and then make the observer also move at 50 to the right and just kind of see what happens there. Okay. All right. So I'm going to end part one of the video here. Okay. And then when I come back, we're going to start to put some math into it and do some examples and stuff for you here. Okay. But the, the important thing to know here is that the moving source alters the wavelength. A moving observer alters the period and therefore the frequency. Okay.